let's take a look at how our servers are resolving internet domain names using the DNS server running on our domain controllers. Now, let's start with a workstation. Here I have a Windows XP workstation, and if we open up a command prompt and bring up an IP config slash all, we see that this system is asking 192.168.0.12 and 192.168.0.10 for DNS lookups. And those are the two IP addresses of my two domain controllers. If we ping win 2008 DC1, it's at dot .10, and if we ping DC2, that's at dot .12. Now, one of the common mistakes I see people make is they would configure the workstations to look to their internet provider's DNS instead of their domain controllers. But unfortunately, the first job of the workstations is to find records for the domain, not for the internet side. They need to be able to do things like, well, ping win 2008 DC1, which it said, okay, well, really I want to talk to my domain. So I'm looking for win 2008 dc1.learnitfirst.ad, the name of my Active Directory. So if I ask my DNS servers, it'll know about that. But what if I go and ask the internet? You know, what if I go and ask one of the big internet DNS servers? It's not going to know the specifics about the internal network I run. So all my workstations must query my domain controllers. And that's why I suggest you put in two domain controllers, each one being an Active Directory domain controller, running DNS, and perhaps even running DHCP. And that way, they will submit their requests to the DNS servers. Now, what do I have to do on my DNS servers? Well, on the DNS servers, what we want to do is we want to configure them to say, okay, I have all this information about the internal domain information, but if I don't know the, uh, I don't know the IP address of the system they're asking me to resolve, well, then I'm going to go and send it to one of the internet DNS servers. And that's where we can put in the IP addresses of the DNS servers my internet provider provides. Or I could utilize, uh, have it go all the way to the top of the internet to do that. So let's take a look at the DNS server here on server 1. So here's my Windows 2008 DC1. And if we look at the forward lookup zones, this server knows everything about learnitfirst.ad and everything about the underscore msdcs.learnitfirst.ad. And if you remember, this is how we go and find the servers and the workstations, and we find specific domain controllers and all that other good information. Now, what if we ask for, say, learnitfirst.com? Well, it's not going to be in any of our forward lookup zones. And so what our server will do is it will attempt to go research it for us. And if we go up to the top of the server here, right-click, and choose Properties, one of the options here is what they call a forwarder. And a forwarders are DNS servers that this server can use to resolve DNS queries for records that this server can't resolve itself. Huh. Well, I don't have any, so how am I actually resolving names like www.learnitfirst.com? Well, over here is what we call the root hints. And these are the top of the internet. There's a server scattered around the globe. If you look, there's A through M. And these are servers all around the globe that are providing... DNS services. And so what you do is, let's say we're looking for, oh, learnexchange.com. Well, we would go up to one of these root servers and ask them, hey, where can I find out about a .com server? And they would give us the IP address. And then we'd go and do the query to that server and say, where can I find out about learnexchange.com? And then they would give us the IP address of the DNS server that's providing information for about that domain. And if we're looking for www, we'd ask that server that gave us say, hey, we need to know the IP address for www.learnitfirst.com or learnexchange.com or microsoft.com or google.com. And they would provide us the information. And if we went looking for, say, an edu, maybe we went looking for where I went to school, Johns Hopkins, so we go for jhu.edu. We'd ask the root servers, where do I find information about edu servers? And they would tell me, oh, go talk to this server. So I'd go ask that server, where do I find information about ghu.edu? And they would say, well, here you go. Here's this server you should talk to. And then they would direct me basically over to the DNS servers at Johns Hopkins that said, hey, where do I find for the biomedical engineering department, BME? Well, they would say, well, go ask this server. And it would go through this whole hierarchy. But that takes a lot of work. 
and that's a lot of different services that have to be communicated with. So what most small and medium-sized businesses do is they don't use these root hints. They go over here to forwarders on each of their DNS servers, and you do have to make this change on each of our DNS servers, and we can go ahead and add the IP addresses that we want. So we click here to add it. So we want to go to 4.2.2.1 to the IP address of our forwarding server. And this is one of the big ones out there on the Internet. Now, your various Internet providers will have different um, DNS servers. Uh, 4.2.2.1 is one that I just remember really well. And that's where we would send our, our queries to. So instead of going hunting down the root hints, we'd go for there. But if we only put in one here, we could run into a potential problem because, well, what if this server is down? We wouldn't be able to look up on the internet. At which point you see a checkbox here that says use the root hints if no forwarders are provided. Now, how can I find out what my ISPs are? I mean, which ones do they want us to use? Well, let's use Google. And what we're going to search for, oh, let me go ahead and add it because it wants to give me a little bit of code. And we're going to look for Comcast. Whoops, ah, we'll get rid of these screens. Comcast. DNS servers. Ah, Windows Security popping up on here. Fine. All right. Add that to the list so that we can do a query against it. Comcast DNS servers. And let's see what they come up with. Ah, look at that. Comcast, or somebody's website here, says lists of the DNS servers for various places around the globe. And in fact, I asked for Comcast, and I bet they're down here under USA. They've probably got, here's all the Comcast DNS servers that you can query against. So we've got them in their national servers. We've got Virginia, Denver, Taylor, Michigan, Huntsville, Alabama, Pennsylvania. So I'm going to go ahead and use one of these instead of that 4221, because Comcast is my internet provider here. So I'm going to right-click, choose Properties, go over here. And we're going to put in that address. Oh, we got an extra space on the end. And it's trying to resolve what that name should be. There we go. Oh, it's in Denver. Okay. And let's go grab another one of these. Let's grab their other secondary that they would like me to use. And we'll paste that in. Okay. Pennsylvania, looks like. And we can go ahead and take that one out. And so now what we're doing is we are going to be sending our queries to those servers if we need them. Now, did we have this in previous versions of Windows? You bet we did. This is a new bit of an interface here where it goes and resolves the name and all that good stuff for you. But what you're doing is you're telling your server, where should I go to get this information? Now, everybody remember 6887.66.196 because we need to go and put that same information on our other DNS server. Now, occasionally I come across an administrator who's told his DC1, to if it can't resolve it, to ask DC2. And they set their DC2, if they can't resolve, to point to DC1 on this DNS level. That wouldn't work because neither of them would ever get out to the Internet. So what we want to do is we want to make sure that we get it right. So oh, let's see. Properties. And let's go to our forwarders. And, oh, we did have a forwarder that was connecting over to one. And we don't want that. We want to edit that. And we want to use this address, the 64. We want to delete that one. And we want to go to the 66. Oh, we got a space on the end because I cut and paste it. And there we go. So this server is going to also look it up. And the root hints, well, they're there. But they'll only be used if the forwarders are not configured or the forwarders fail. But the idea is now either of my domain controllers can act on its own and go research records on the Internet. And through Active Directory Replication, they're keeping any data that they know about in-house. And now I should be able to find just about any domain pretty quick. Because Comcast, in this case, they're able to... Basically, they run a lot larger DNS. They devote dedicated servers at each of those IP addresses to respond to DNS queries, and they cache the information so that when I go and ask them, hey, where's learnsqlserver.com, uh, they don't have to go research it all the way at the top of the Internet. They say, oh, we had a person there two seconds ago, and they'll provide the IP address right back for us. So what we've done is we've made our queries for DNS a lot 
uh, cheaper as far as network bandwidth and network uh, communication time goes. And so now my users, let's go check out our Windows XP machine here. Well, our users don't know anything's changed. If we pull up the command prompt and do an IP config slash all, they are still asking dot twelve and dot ten. They don't know anything about the upstream servers because they ask our DNS servers, and our DNS servers will take them to where they want to go. So if we go to Google, Google, see it's already getting set up to come right up for us. There's Google, learn SQL server.com, and turn off phishing filter and there we go we get right to learn SQL server and there we go we're able to pull up websites really quickly heck let's try one that who knows if Comcast has been there recently let's just try my website oh actually that might not come in right because I'm actually inside my network and it through some weirdness might not work let's try instead let's try uh, oh learn it first.com there we go Speaking of my website, why wouldn't my website have worked? Confuser.com. Well, I'm recording all these videos on my own network, and the web server is actually inside my firewall. And so many firewalls won't let you go out and come back in again. So could I fix this problem? Well, yeah, I can. I happen to know that the internal address of my web server is... 192, 168, 250. It's on a different network. And I could actually put that information right here into my DNS. So I'm going to go ahead and make a new zone for, oh, let's make it. We're going to send it to all of our domain controllers for confuser.com. And I'm not going to allow any dynamic updates. This is my public, uh, or this is my internal DNS, but for my uh, web server. And I'm going to go ahead and say, all right, well, if you're looking for information about this website, and you're probably going to be looking for the www version, I want you to go to 192.168.250.180, the IP address that you referenced internally to my site. So I've now built a brand new zone, and let's see what our Windows XP system does. Well, actually, we should make sure it replicates around, so we want to, might want to give it a couple seconds so that we can see the confuser.com zone over here. But what's going to happen is we'll return this record, and it will never go and ask the Internet, where is that information? It's going to ask the internal DNS. And this way I can uh, control the internal records I see. And this may be required if you do the hosting of the server at the same place that you do the management of uh, you're doing all your network management. If you've outsourced your website and things like that, the internet records will be just fine. Uh, webmail servers is another thing you quite often have to do this for so that you can reference the internal address so you don't go out your firewall to the public address only to come back in again. Ah, uh, come on. Let's see if we can... It's just taking its time. Let's see if we can get XP to find it. Let's go ping www.confuser.com Yeah, see, it's still coming up with that outside address, which is a bad thing because I'm inside that network already. But if we do an IP config flush DNS, got to do a slash in there. That says, okay, forget any entries you've looked up recently. Let's see how this zone's going. Active Directory Replication is going to take a while. So let's see, what can I do? Well, I'm going to, just so that we can get this to happen, I'm going to stop Server 2's DNS here, kind of forcing this machine to look up on 1. So now if we do... There we go. See, notice now we're seeing the new address. And if I'll explain why I stopped that server. If we look here, I was looking to both 10 and 12. And it was possible that I was asking 12 the question, and 12 was still going out to the Internet because it hasn't had that replication happen yet. But 10 we knew definitely had the information. And now, if we go to the website, I'm pulling up the site just fine. So what we've got here is, uh, from our client's perspective, we don't have to change anything. We can solve all of our name resolution problems directly from the servers themselves. We've got our internal records, 
And then we've got any special records that might be servers that are internal just to us, but the Internet side shows the public uh, information. And there we go. There's some information on how DNS works and how you can configure your servers to speed up the DNS resolution and also to solve any little internal problems. Let's see if our forward lookup zones have finished replicating just while I've been talking. It's thinking about it. Oh, actually, no, it's not thinking about it because we need to start back up that server. There we go. That should let us get some updated information now. There we go. Look, that information is now replicated. And that's often what I'll do for things like webmail. So if we needed to point to the webmail server for learnitfirst.com instead of learnitfirst.ad, we would make a zone for learnitfirst.com. And we wouldn't allow dynamic updates because we want these to be manual records we create. And in here we might put the IP address of our webmail and other records that we need to find that might be inside the same network we're operating on.